in Russell's prayer, he said that we want to do what God tells us to do. I think you will remember that. And then you all said amen to that. So one of the, um, one of the um, things that God tells us to do um, in Scripture that um, doesn't get much of a run in um, Scottish households. And I grew up in a church with an English minister, so he never mentioned this. Um, we are told to greet one another with a kiss of love. Um, we find that at the end of First Peter, 1 Peter uh, 5.14, greet one another with a kiss of love. Um, but you will also find it, um, greet one another with a holy kiss in Romans 16.16, 16, 1 Corinthians 16.20, 2 Corinthians 13.12, and 1 Thessalonians 5.26. Five times you're told to greet one another with a kiss. And how many people managed that this morning? Well, <laughs> don't come near me. I'm Scottish, remember? The, um, um, J.B. Phillips, who was one of the first people to try and translate the um, Bible into uh, modern language, suitable for young people to read, uh, back in the, I think, um, late 50s, uh, into the 60s. It was a popular translation when the only things we had was the King James Bible and the RSV, um, J, the J.B. Phillips translation. He, being an Englishman, translated this verse as give each other a handshake all round as a sign of love. Uh, yeah, uh, he, the closest he could get to a kiss was a handshake. And... Um, and I can understand, um, obviously we've got cultural things going on here, that um, what um, J.B. Phillips is um, observing is that the kiss is somehow a uh, first century greeting, a Greco-Roman greeting, and he was trying to translate that into language that, um, um, <laughs> I was going to say modern young people, but that was back in the 50s, they're no longer <laughs> modern young people, you are the oldies. Um, um, and um, I was obviously uh, too young at that point. But the um, give each other a handshake. And I think something that we're told to do five times is something that we ought to give some kind of attention to. And so the first, I think, and reasonable question to ask when looking at this uh, verse is to ask, who did kissing in the first century? Um, obviously, um, there's always been uh, the romance of kissing, but public kissing, who greeted one another with kisses in the first century? Now, uh, my brother, who also is um, Scottish, um, married into a Ukrainian family. And let me tell you that they all do kissing. When the Spencers and the Demodoskis get together, you have to be kissed by everyone, um, both cheeks. Um, and then after we've done all this greeting, the Spencers gather <laughs> into a corner and try to recover from all this, um, from all this emotional um, get-together. But it was similar in the first century in that it was families who greeted one another with a kiss. Not strangers. So it's unlike the handshake. I mean, it's a, the handshake is actually a bad translation um, in this context because the handshake is what you do with strangers. When you meet someone for the first time or you're in a business context or something like that, the handshake is the kind of greeting that we use. But in the first century, the kiss was the kiss of family. And that's why it's called a holy kiss, because holy is the word for saints. And so it's the kiss of the saints. It's the kiss of the family. And the kiss of love here in First Peter is the love of family. It's a kiss of family. So I think a fair translation um, of this verse is welcome one another as family. We are family together. And when we come together, we need to welcome 
each other as family. So this is why um, you get a warm smile from me. Although I did get a hug from Jill this morning. Uh, she's handing out hugs. Um, and, uh, but um, you'll get a warm smile because that's the best the Spencers ever do uh, when they um, get together. Um, unless the Demodoskis are there to um, fix us up. Uh, but what Peter is saying is that you are family together. You are not a group of strangers. And this was particularly um, uh, in, uh, significant in the first century, and we'll look at um, why. But you need to remember that the um, early church is meeting in people's homes. They're meeting in homes together, and as they come into the home, they greet one another as family. Uh, this is the significance of church in um, First Peter. They call one another brothers and sisters um, at Delphoi. They call the, um, it, one of the things about the early church was um, they were accused of um, um, two great libels. The first is that they were cannibalistic because they ate um, the body of Jesus and drank his blood. And we know that's a misunderstanding of the communion. But the second thing they were accused of was incest. Because um, the husbands and, and we greet, um, the husbands and wives would greet one another as brothers and sisters. That's particularly significant because in the first century, um, this is true, in the first century, your sister was more important to you than your wife. Um, this, um, it's a bit different now. Um, uh, but in the first century, the sister was more important because the sister was always family. If the wife messed up, you could divorce her and send her home to her family, and it was their problem. But if your sister messed up, it was always your problem because you were family together. That strongest bond was the bond of um, family. And so when uh, Peter tells us to greet one another as family, he's saying that the water of baptism is thicker than blood. The most important relationships that we have are our relationships together. Salvation is participation in Jesus, not getting a personal ticket for the glory drain. I mean, it used to be um, quite common, this idea of um, salvation. It's like getting a ticket, getting ready uh, to go to heaven. And um, Cliff Richard, I think, um, saying about um, getting on the glory train. And when I think of um, trains, because uh, I grew up in Melbourne, uh, I think of people not talking to each other. You don't make eye contact on a train uh, in Melbourne, it might be different in other parts of the world, but not in Melbourne, no eye contact. Very, I mean, very separate. We were all going to the same place, but nobody wanted to talk about it. Uh, whereas, if we're going to be family together, we need to realize that our salvation brings us into family, into participation in the life of Jesus, and not as something separate. We are children of God. We are part of of the body of Christ. And therefore, we are brothers and sisters together. Um, Brene Brown, um, an American um, sociologist, uh, psychologist, uh, was, talks about the need, that the need to, uh, we need to belong. We need to be find somewhere where we belong, not just fit in. She says the opposite of belonging is fitting in. Fitting in is when you try to be what the group is so that they will accept you, so that you can fit in. You change what you, how you dress, how you think, how you act because you want to fit in. But true belonging is when you can come as you are and be accepted. And that's family. I mean, family is about the place where you can come as you are and fit in. Um, uh, so, um, th did you see the movie, um, um, the second um, Avatar movie? Yeah. What was that, the thing of, what? The, the Way of the Water. Um, and it, the Avatar movies, is a big blue alien people 
um, floating somewhere in space. I don't know where they get those actors, but um, uh, you'd think you'd see them on TV, big and blue. But there they are. And the greeting that they do when they meet someone is, I see you. I see you. That was worth the price of paying for the movie. It was a good movie, but that was worth the price of paying the movie. I see you, a place where you are seen and accepted as you are. This is the kind of world that Peter is describing for the church that he writes to. Now, when Peter um, uses this image of um, family, he's not arguing that the Greco-Roman family is God's ideal family type. He's not arguing that the church must model itself and its practices on first century families. What he is doing is looking for a way to highlight important truths about the church. And among the various cultural options that were open to him, the family was the most useful one. The reason the family was the most useful one to him is because Greco-Roman society is very competitive. Um, there's um, limited, scarce resources, limited resources, only so much to go around. And so if you got more, somebody had to get less. That's the way they thought. And so when people dealt with others in public, it was always a win-lose situation. If I lose, you win. If I win, you lose. And so the, inter the interaction was always uh, difficult. As you read through the Gospels and you see Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees and the scribes and stuff, it's a win-lose situation. They're not trying to find collectively some uh, outcome. They're competing. They're competing for the respect and the um, um, approval of the crowd. And so every action, interaction is win-lose, except, except within families. Because in families, you're all in it together. The family wins or loses together. And so the, if you want a relationship in the first century that is cooperative and supportive and providing mutual support, you have to look at the family as the model for that. Each family member deemed the wealth and social prestige of the family as of equal or greater value than their personal happiness. Now that's different from the 21st century family um, where individualism is part of our culture and uh, I mean we live in Adelaide, my family's in um, uh, Melbourne, Colleen's family's um, Portland scattered across America. Um, the I mean, we don't have that same kind of relationship. But that is the relationship that Peter is drawing on to say this is what church is like. That in church, the collective um, happiness, as um, Tani was trying to um, say with her team analogy, um, the collective is more important than the individual. That is what we are called to when we're called to greet one another as family. When we greet one another, your welfare, the welfare of us all, is more important than my personal um, happiness or achievement. A person's identity, from the father of the household all the way to the slaves within their household, resided in their belonging to family. Um, their family name was the most important part of who they are. For many of us, we only ever use our first name, and our family names are no longer um, of particular um, significance. Uh, we are individuals. But in the first century, your family name was what actually identified you, what gave you your identity. Um, psychologically, a person's identity um, resided in the um, commitment of relationship with the family. 
And so Peter is saying that our identity comes not from whether or not we're aliens and strangers or whether we're uh, respected and well loved by the community. What uh, our identity comes from is our relationship with the church family. Uh, ordinarily, a um, uh, Greco-Roman family was held together by common religion. And the actual, uh, for many of these um, people that Peter is writing to, they've actually broken with their family, their blood family, their family um, of origin, the family that they belong to that gives them their identity in order to follow after Jesus instead of following after the Greek or the Roman um, gods. And so what, this is why when we get to the household cords in First Peter, part of that is how do you manage when you're a person of faith in a household that has a different religion. And so um, at um, some point, um, I'll get Julie to uh, sort that one out for us. But for the, for the moment, what's important here is that the people that Peter is talking to had actually given up their old identities in order to take on new identities as members of God's family. And as members of God's family, they are told to love one another, to greet each other with the kiss of love, but also to love the family of believers, it says in 2.17. And in... Um, 123, we're told that we are born, uh, born anew. Uh, in one, chapter 1, verse 3, we're told that we are people of new birth. We have come into a new family um, of God. And as people in this family, we have an obligation to love one another. To love one another as people who... Um, have more significance to us than even our own self. And he, um, Peter says in verse 22, failure to show proper hospitality to one another um, is a, is a um, grievous um, sin because it means that we're breaking the very relationship um, that, uh, und that connects us within um, our relationship with God. And so the, um, the um, title of this um, upcoming lunch is Being Church, Lunch Edition. Because it's not just that we're going out to lunch, it's that by having lunch together, we are being church. And um, if my family have any kind of um, greeting, it's like finding food somewhere. Um, um, <laughs> My mother buys whole packets of biscuits, uh, chocolate biscuits, for when I arrive, because that's her way of showing that I'm loved and cared for. And my way of showing I'm loved and cared for is to eat all the chocolate biscuits <laughs> um, in there, so she has to buy another packet when uh, it's, a, it's a thing. Um, but it's, it's about being church together. And so lunch is an expression of that. I'm just one expression of it. But it's one way of saying that we greet one another as brothers and sisters. Uh, the family of God is bonded together in God's love. And I think um, that's the crucial part of being born into the family. We're born into the family. We're born um, with the love of God. And that means that loving one another... It's not something we have to manufacture. It's something we have to nurture and encourage. Um, if you've got brothers and sisters, you know that um, they're not always ideal playmates or ideal supporters or whatever, but you know that there is a love that is there, that is there because you're born into the family. And, and, that, and as we seek to... Uh, love one another. We seek not to find love from within ourselves, but we find love from God within us. And this leads Peter to uh, one of the great, um, uh, great descriptions of life 
um, in the church perhaps. He says in um, verse 22 of chapter 1, most important of all, continue to show deep love for each other for love covers a multitude of sins. Um, Scott McKnight um, in his commentary says that deep love speaks of the effort required and the duration um, of it. Loving one another isn't always easy. I mean, I can, I can imagine it's always easy to love Colleen. Might not always be easy to love me. Uh, sometimes, some things take more effort. Sometimes things um, take a deeper love if they're going to actually uh, work. And what Peter is saying to us is that just because it takes an effort doesn't mean that we stop. We have to keep loving one another because love covers a multitude of sins. And this, I think, is um, a really important point. Often we talk about forgiveness of sins, but Peter here talks about love covering a multitude of sins. And that's because sin at its essence is broken relationship. Sin at its essence is the breaking of um, a relationship. So sin against God is when we break relationship with God. But sin against one another is when our relationships get broken. And the solution to broken relationships is more than forgiveness. The solution to broken relationships is love. We have to love one another if we are going to be able to uh, deal with a multitude of sins. And Peter, apostle uh, to the church, um, knows enough to know that there is going to be a multitude of sins within the church. Not look, I shouldn't look at anyone in particular. I'll just look down at my notes. Just looking down at my notes. There is going to be broken relationships. You, um, it happens. It happens in families, but it happens in churches. Um, that is... That's to be expected because we have to um, uh, grow and um, engage and deal with one another if we are to live um, together. And that will lead to broken relationships. And sometimes it will be um, accidental, but other times it will be <laughs> almost um, intentional. And our choice at that point is not to vote people off the island. Um, you can do that if it's a reality TV show. You can't do that if you're a church. You can't just vote people off the island because you're unhappy with them. What you have to do is love them and love them de deeply. Uh, Peter says that we are to be generous to one another. Cheerf cheerfully share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Love uh, brings us together in order to care and share with one another. To take the closed um, 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 fists, the closed hands that keep things to ourselves and open them so that we might be generous in the way that we care and support one another. Um, I want to say in terms of um, the bonds that hold us together, um, a couple of things. One is my dad died of dementia. And so there was a period um, in his life when he stopped knowing that he was my dad. He stopped knowing that he was um, my mum's husband. He stopped knowing who he was. But it didn't stop him being family because we held that. We held that. He didn't have to hold it because we are together in family and we hold it for one another. And so family is about holding one another. Even when someone is lost, in dementia, we can still hold that. 
But it's also true that it's even lost when they've run away from home. Um, the prodigal son is my favorite um, gospel story. And it's the story of the son who runs away because he wants to be, uh, wants to be on his own and use his resources for himself. And the dad is waiting at home, waiting at home to receive him. And when he sees the son, he runs to him, puts his arms around him and kisses him because he's family. He's welcome. There's not a sense of um, exclusion. There's not a sense of having to work his way back into the family he's loved. Um, Jesus' practice of um, table fellowship showed that he was, uh, when he talked about um, family and love, it was a, it was a broad table. Uh, people from the east and the west and the high and the low were all brought together in the table of Jesus because Jesus is family represents the family that is to come of every tongue and every tribe. And in particular, Jesus' um, meals um, table was open to the aliens and the exiles, the strangers, um, those who had um, been marginalized by society. It was the care for all. And our church, if it is to be the family of Jesus, needs to reflect that too. And somewhere, I've lost page seven. <laughs> but it is the last page. <laughs> I'm guessing um, that that's God's way of saying, "Don't stop, Stephen." <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm thinking that's what I'm. I'm hearing that. I'm hearing that. Um, just um, so, just to end uh, by um, summarizing uh, where we've uh, got to with that. Even a church the size of Christie's Beach, it's not a uh, it's not a huge church, but it's a church that can become public space rather than um, family space, and so we have to work at welcoming one another. Uh, we've um, and putting priority on the Welcome and Hospitality team um, to try and encourage that. But you can outsource it to others to do the welcoming. We are responsible. There's, um, there's a trick in family counseling. Uh, if you ever get involved in family counseling, this is your clue. Um, they always put out one more chair than the fa number of family members who are coming for counseling because it's where the gap is that shows um, something of the uh, different relationships. Who sits next to who in it? Um, so that's, that's, your, that's your clue when you go to family counseling. And I think it's um, a little true in church as well. Now, the gaps in the, mo um, in the church at the moment are a bit caused by um, um, people being out with the kids' church and stuff like that. But in some churches... Um, you, you le you're meant to leave gaps. Uh, in the church I grew up in with pews, you always left gaps between families. It wasn't a sense of coming together. But if we are family, then we come together as family. And so sitting next to people that you're um, not used to or whatever is part of family um, life together, being family together. We are born of God, and that means that this is not something that we have to manufacture from somewhere else, but something that we allow to flow through us. And that, what flows through us, is the love of God, which makes it possible for us to treat one another as brothers and sisters. That leads us into a way of life that reflects God's character and his being. But in all of that, if we are to reflect God's character, if we are to share God's love, we must be open to all of us. And that means the marginalized, the aliens, and the exiles, the strangers. We need to find a way to make them feel at home in the family. We need to make them feel like they belong and that they can be encouraged and supported by us. In all this, 
if we are family together, God will bless us. And at this point, we're going to have the uh, music team come back and lead us in a, a song of God's blessing. <laughs>